about how all of us, whether we are with nonprofits or whether we're journalists or whether we work in business or wherever we are, we're recognizing, I think, that we have to dramatically, some people would say radically, change the way we communicate if we want to continue to reach large audiences. So we want to talk for a few minutes this morning about the digital revolution and just try to set this up. We know this is a conversation, so we promise not to go more than 10 minutes. A little bit about, and so this is a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation. This will not be death by PowerPoint, we promise. <laughs> so a little bit about us, as I said, uh, I was a journalist for 20 years. I worked at the Dayton Daily News, and then I was state house bureau chief of the Cincinnati Inquirer before I went to Ohio State. What I do now in our program is we help journalists make the transition to digital media storytelling, and then we run three day intensive digital media KIPP camps. So we do a lot of social media training, and I also just got my PhD Educational policy and leadership. So, sort of moving the education around. My name is Ann Fisher. I was a journalist for the newspaper business for 27 years before I moved over to the radio business, um, public media. I do television as well. Um, I uh, was a state house reporter with uh, Deb. That's how we know it to each other originally. And um, that's uh, pretty much where I'm at right now. She does radio. I do radio for the public media. We took that picture. Uh, I've, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, <laughs> so we just want to start out this morning by saying good morning from the Twitter sphere. This is a data visualization of Twitter, and it actually just shows how many people in a 24-hour period are saying good morning on Twitter, or posting with the word good morning, about 11,000 people. And they're all over the world. More than half of actually all tweets today are in other languages besides English. There's about 50 million tweets every 24 hours, and I think it's just a good, gives you a good sense of what's going on in just the Twitter environment. The, the green are people who are tweeting out early. The black are people who are tweeting good morning when it's not morning, so they had a good party last night. Uh, but it's just gives you a sense of the space. And then this, I think this gives us a sense of what we're talking about. In the 30 seconds that I'm standing here, there'll be more than 300 new blogs posted. We'll spend more than $6,000 on virtual goods, which I just find a little mind-blowing. It's when you know I use my credit card and I buy a margarita for someone on Facebook, a fake margarita, a virtual margarita, or flowers, or a fake island in Second Life, that sort of thing. So we're spending a lot of money just virtually. And if you take a look in just a 30-day period, more than 27 million new blog posts, trillions of text messages, billions of Google searches, so it's just huge space. And what we talk about a lot in the KIPP program is, you know, the Pew Foundation says we are in the midst of the biggest digital media revolution, uh, really the biggest communication revolution since the invention of the printing press, and that took more than 200 years for us to feel the full impact. I really like this quote. It's not just like TV replacing radio. It's more along the lines of fire, agriculture, and listerine breath strips. It was a really big invention. <laughs> And so it's making a big impact, and it's happening very fast. To really understand the space, you have to go back to what we call BG, before Google. And it is, you know, the first thing we want to do is find our classmates. But I mean, just take a look at how crowded it gets. In 04, Facebook went public. Now there's 400 million of us on Facebook. We would be the third largest country in the world, behind China and India, if we were a country. 05, when you think about it, YouTube just came on in 05, which sort of blows my mind. It just hasn't been very long since we could start to do video. And then 06, 07, look what it looks like today. And I think this is why a lot of us are here. I mean, we call this shift happens. You know, they talk about this, we it's not our, our term, they talk about this on the internet. But I think we're all feeling the ground shift beneath our feet. It's overwhelming. And we want to talk a little bit today about the impact of moving from what we call the mass communications world. This is the world we all know, right? We've been in it where the journalists were at the top. And we, you know, own the big media, the newspapers and the factories and the, you know, the radio stations. And we own the fleets of trucks that got the news to you. And today, look what's happened. Now we're in a massive communications world where all of us are telling our own stories, and we've got all these new tools to tell the stories with. And now I tell my friend, and they tell their friend, and then it goes to millions of people. And in some ways, I think we take this for granted, but this is a revolution. I mean, that's the revolution. It's not just that we have new tools. It's that everything about the way that we send out information has changed. And now we all know this has had a huge impact on traditional media. 
And so we have to decide, does traditional media become a, a, a victim of it, or does traditional media evolve? And, and one of the, the big problems with traditional media is, it, at least in our country, is capitalistic. It re relies on ad revenue. And ad revenue is uh, what has changed so drastically. This is just for magazines, now 18%. Television, 23%. So it's not all necessarily television's taking it from us, from, from the newspapers. That's the same, it's only us mode. Uh, but in newspapers, ad revenue in 09, down 28%. Massive, massive change. And whenever uh, anything goes down that far, what, what ha you know, whenever you lose that much money in a business, the first thing to go, because the most expensive thing you have has to go first, is, of course, human resources. It's that way everywhere. Everybody knows that. In uh, 2007, a little over 2,000 journalists were laid off. 2009, 40,000 journalists. I know, it's stunning. Laid off. It's stunning. Um, and, and over the last decade, about a third of the working newspaper journalism world has been laid off. That does not count people like Deb and I who jumped ship, if you will. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not a journalist uh, anymore. It's just that I jumped ship from newspapers. Still, what we are left with is fewer and fewer people to do what? A bigger and bigger and bigger job. Uh, Deb and I were just talking, we were both state house reporters. Back then, there were about three times as many state house reporters covering state government 20 years ago. In Ohio, which is a very big state government state, seven major media areas, three times as many as are covering it today. Now, you got to ask yourself, is this what you want from your journalism, a third of, of the people covering a bigger and bigger and bigger job? So, so just in with saying it's not just the new tools, as I said, it's the new thinking. So this, I think this just sums it up really well. This used to be America's most trusted broadcaster. Who is it today? Time Magazine did an informal poll. Anybody want to guess? Yeah, and I think it's because... Yay! I mean, I'm happy about this in the sense that I don't want people to tell me that's the way it is, and I don't trust you if you do. So I'm looking for people to be more engaging. So what we often say is, you know, if you use new tools and old school thinking, it's really hashtag fail. It just doesn't work. And so what we want to talk about partly is just how we have to be more informal and engaging and creative in all of these things today if we want to continue to get our stories out. But what I'd love to just, we just want to facilitate a conversation because what do you think this means? All of this, the fact that there's fewer journalists, but more of us telling our <coughs> stories. What does this mean for us in this new space? Newspapers, the question is, I was just having an argument with a complete, total stranger slash Facebook friend on Facebook last night about this. You know, are newspapers dead? Well, probably they're dying and they're going to die, but do we want journalism to go down the same path? Is that what we want? I always say journalism is like wine. I'm not buying it for the bottom. <laughs> I'm buying for the wine. So <laughs> can we can change separate the vessel? journalism from the paper? Right. Can we change the vessel successfully and make a problem because journalism is a problem? So let's just sort of throw it out. What do you guys think is exciting about this? You know, what's what makes you nervous? What um, what do you want to talk about? What makes you nervous? Yeah. I heard someone talk to um, someone had broken a news story on the blog or news story, but um, and the, the news of the conversation was about, you know, is this person a journalist or blog? And, and I heard someone tweet that, like, it's, you know, it's not about who's a journalist, but it's was that an active journalist? Mm. So it didn't meet the criteria to right. certain standards. So I thought that was an interesting way to think yeah. about it. That's a great way. I mean, I'm sort of over it now. I mean, I, you know, I used to be sort of caught up in that. But I think for me, you know, when the plane landed in the Hudson and the first picture was on Twitter, and then people were tweeting from the wings of the plane. And meanwhile, the New York Times is just trying to get people down to the subway and you know, figure out what the heck happened. In that moment for me, I was like, OK, it's just, it, it really doesn't matter. What matters is, is the story powerful? And is it accurate? And you know, do we know something about who's telling the story? The people on the wings of the plane were pretty accurate. You know? Well, and for me, I mean, Twitter, I wasn't sure what Twitter was back then. But for me, when it really came home was in Iran, when they were having the riots in Iran. And I remember back in 19, whatever year it was, when they took over the embassy there, and we didn't know what was going on. And now, we knew what was going on. And we could see pictures of it. I tell journalists, and I think this is a little controversial, maybe, but because um, we do a lot of training with journalists, and they'll say, well, you know, my newsroom's not paying me to Twitter. And I said, well, my newsroom didn't pay me to keep a Rolodex. <laughs> I mean, they paid me to stay on top of the news. And Twitter is a great way to do that. And I think we're caught up. And I say we're, selling is not selling out people. 
I mean, we all can't just rely on our masthead anymore to get the news you know, to people, so we have to think about how do we get people to come to our stories, and if that requires Facebook or Twitter or all of those things. I sold every time I wrote a lead. I sold every time I tried to get someone to jump to the next, you know, inside. So every time you write a story, you're selling, in a sense. So I think we got to think about it differently. Yeah, I would add to that by saying that I think there's a there's a changing understanding about Twitter that it is not. Mm -hmm. I had a bagel oh, at yeah. Pub Camp, Ohio, and not is it the eyewitness yeah. like you're talking sure. about, but it's the search. Oh, it is. And also because of these lists that just came in a few yeah. months ago, the ability to follow people that you really are, you know, like Jared Cohen who opened up the Iran. I can follow him yeah. and put him in my Washington list, and I can search. I can use right. Twitter. That person who says they don't pay me to Twitter should be looking at Twitter as yeah. a research. It's a filtering tool, collaborative filtering. You're, you're, if you're following really smart people, they will they will yes. filter the news for you. But if you're, you know, it's like television. You can follow <laughs> the equivalent of, um, I say, uh, what's the real uh, Gilligan's Island. Or you can follow the equivalent of the Discovery Channel. It's all about how you set up your channel. Yeah. Just to give a concrete example, um, when protests were starting in Kyrgyzstan a month or so ago, um, I started pulling together a Twitter list of people in Kyrgyzstan who were tweeting uh, using Twitter's uh, geographic search capability for find folks. And I found around 20 people, but one of the people happened to be a member of parliament who seemed rather interesting. And, uh, you know, some NPR reporters are really interested in using Twitter, others were a bit more skeptical, but what kind of changed minds when they saw that the person, this a member of parliament that I found that was tweeting, suddenly became the leader of the new government after oh, the revolution. Wow. And so we had this whole record of everything she had tweeted in the days wow. leading up to her becoming in charge. Wow. wow. Yeah. We're headed at the end of this month to Ukraine, and we're training the Ukrainian um, Council of Ministers in social media and how to use these new tools to be more transparent. And it's really interesting to me when you're starting to train folks who are not used to this and thinking through, okay, now I'm listening to people in a real-time way, you know. I think, too, when we were talking about that earlier, it's a control thing, too. People are afraid of giving up control. And you said that that was one of the questions that came It was so funny, because one of their questions was, we were talking about the healthcare debate in this country, and how it was playing out on social media, and they were saying, but how did your government control that? And we said, they didn't. And they said, well, how are they controlling the message? And we said, are you watching the healthcare debate? <laughs> because no one's controlling the message. It's all over the map, but it is just, you know, it's that moving away from control and thinking. We say think influence, don't think control. But it's, it's interesting to know, you know, with the whole death, the death, what are the, the death panels came out of was Sarah Palin's <coughs> That's where it started. She used, was the first person to use that reference, and it was in her blog. It was not, you know, some columnist. I think this is great and wonderful and healthy that we have that we have blogs, great news, we have I get my Twitter's my primary source, my first source, not my, not my most trusted source, that's you know, for the daily show. Uh, it's my, my first source of news. But Gordon Lightfoot's still alive, so you still have this, you know, the problem that who do you who do you trust on the blogs, who do you trust on Twitter? And you know, you can wait for the New York Times to something to confirm it, even they sometimes get caught up that, you know, we'll repeat it again. So the crowd weighs in so much more now. Like even, like I was looking at a book the other day trying to decide whether to buy it, and so many people would weigh in on it, and they were just trashing this book, and I thought, we didn't used to have that kind of input. We used to just have the blurbs on the back of the book that we don't trust, you know? So I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, it's harder to find out who to trust, but I also think you have more, more people weighing in on stuff, so. In, in many ways, very democratic. I was, with regards to your earlier statement uh, about uh, yeah. who's at the top of the heap and, and guarding the castle, so to speak, Jeff had mentioned prior to you starting that uh, with his public radio station, Kent, the only time they seem to engage with their listeners is when they ask for money uh, during the pledge drive. I was recently in Chicago and I had passed over the NBC affiliate and they were filming the uh, 10 p.m. news and uh, their engagement with the audience with the people standing out in the rain looking through the windows. And you wonder why that type of engagement is, is you know, why should I stand in the rain and look at some people with makeup on when I can just go and sit in front of my computer and read what everybody has got to say. Or broadcast my own message. Yeah. I mean, that's very interesting. Um, I do consulting for uh, political candidates. Okay, they all want to know, how do I use social media to raise money to get people to vote for me to make a difference? And they want to run their social media platforms like a campaign. You start 90 days before the election, you pop out a whole bunch
book is stubborn and says, give me money, vote for me, give me money, vote for me, here's why. And they expect to get a bond, but they don't. And I tell each and every one of them, it's a very long-term process to build credibility. If you stand for something that you really believe in, and you're talking about it honestly and sharing that information, over a long period of time, people will begin to trust you and follow you. And then you have it. It's just another way of relationship. Though. Yeah, exactly. It's a combination of what we call, you know, Jay Rosen coined the term mind casting. You got to do mind casting on Twitter. You got to put out stuff that actually people are going to find useful. And also live casting, because I want to know a little bit about who you are. And then broadcasting. But if all you're doing is pushing out information, you're the guy who <coughs> says, I'm so great. Did you hear how great I was? And look what I did that was great last week. And I'm going to do this great thing next week. And nobody cares. So yeah, wait, she had a question. Cool. And then we'll get to you. No, I just want to get back to the original question. The member is the one that was touched on after. Sort of thing though, just for a second. I'm from southern Kentucky, family of eight. Most of us didn't graduate from high school. My brother lives in a trailer, you know, in Tateville. And he just friended me on Facebook last month. And I really got online and went, I called him. Tommy, is this you on Facebook? Because he's never had a computer ever. And my stepdad is a truck driver, and he's calling me and saying, You have to check out this app, because he just got his Google phone. And so I think it's really changing. I'm not saying there isn't a gap, but especially with mobile phones. I mean, my PhD was in Appalachian uh, culture, and so I'm really tuned in a lot to that uh, population that a lot of underserved folks. And I'm blown away by how many of them are now friending me on Facebook. I mean, it's changing, I would just say. Did, who, oh, we said he was next. Sorry. She was well, well before me. I have a question. OK. <laughs> you and well, then you. And speaking of underserved populations, um, I just wanted to put a shout out for newspapers and radio. Um, I work for the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging. and. The biggest response we get is when we have a story in the paper or something on TV or something on the radio. So, I mean, my, my Facebook, is, it's, it's, it's out there, but advertising, but it's still, if I get something in the dispatch, we get a huge response. So newspaper and it's, readers are very responsive to absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's why I'm interested in the outcomes, because I could tweet till the cows come right. home, but if I'm not reaching the right people, right. if I'm not reaching the low-income subsidy person that needs Medicare right. help, then I'm not getting any any response. And so it's. I think when we're talking about audiences, it's so diverse, and so... I want to reach the, the caregivers, but I also want to reach the older adults. And, and so it's interesting that I really want to know what value I get by spending my time as an advocacy outreach person yeah, on Twitter on, and Facebook. And we do, you know, when you're starting to think about strategy, it also depends on who you're, who is your audience. I mean, you're not going to reach those folks probably on Twitter. My brother Tommy's probably never going to get on Twitter. But also, how does Tommy find out about your agency? I mean, you know, it's not... There are a lot of strategic things you have to really think through before you decide which channels you want to open, because it's a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, the newspaper is a factor now. It's going to become less and less and less a factor as those older people change. Yeah, yeah. You change. look at the demographics, and, but but the fastest growing segment of folks getting you getting in social media is people over 55. So it is changing. That sort of touches on what I wanted to sort of highlight and ask about have some thoughts on, which is, um, you know, Sarah Palin was mentioned. Uh, as, as the you know the death penalty thing came out of there. Well, the thing is, though, Sarah Palin was already famous through traditional media, right. um, which is what made that made people follow her to begin with. I'm kind of curious, you know, watching those ad revenues falling for all, all across the traditional media landscape. Um, obviously, there's some major shifts going on there, and you're seeing them knock down a couple notches. Right. But you know, whether it's uh, Sully Sullenberger landing in the Atlantic, or whether it's the the Gulf uh, spill. We didn't have traditional media right now out there covering it. Would there be a real national story, or would it be a collection of individual people tweeting about it? And would the national consciousness or the, the regional consciousness 
uh, be the same? Would, would people get the story? I mean, don't, looking don't, at, at actual journalism. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm all for. I mean, I believe we need journalism and professional journalism and people who are can hold That's people accountable. That's the question. How do we make it to help but, survive? You know, and I was an investigative reporter, and I think about it when I was at the Inquirer. You know, they would give me two years to do a story. Plus, I would have a. I know this seems so amazing now. Plus, I would have a travel budget, and I would have a photographer and a database guy. You know, and you look back now and think that's just not happening. And I worry most about that, about, you know, and the governor had to meet with me because I was with the Cincinnati Inquirer and he had to address what was happening. And does he have to meet with the folks who are just twittering? It's a big issue. It is a big issue. And, and it, but then there are other things that are changing. There's another kind of thing going on that I experienced when I was on, on the air last week or something and we were talking about campaign. I know it was on, it was on election day. We were talking about elections and that sort of thing in the process. And a woman got on the phone, you know, on, on a radio show. And she said, well, she goes, she wanted to ask about campaign finance. And she'd been, she'd been on the internet looking at so-and-so's campaign finance report and had a question about whether he could spend money on a car using his campaign campaign funds. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, I remember back 20 years ago when the campaign finance reports came out, we all hauled our sorry bucks over to the Secretary of State's office and sat there with literally piles of paper covering 10 tables of campaign finance reports. And we had to go through it like this, you know, to get to the bottom of it to find just the aggregates. All right, now this, this woman, I don't know who she is, she can get online and go and look it up for herself. So that's where, can we be smarter about how we use that information and how we have to feel like we have to disseminate that kind of information? I don't think we have to disseminate it like we used to. That's different. Because I'm not saying it's all bad, because actually I was thinking about writing a uh, column called Celebrating the Death of the Gatekeeper. You know, because in the end, even though I was a journalist, I was always having to sell people above me on, yes, it really matters that we write about the plight of people with mental illness, or, you know, those were the kinds of stories I was working on, and they were always like, really, why do we want to do this project? So, I, but I'm just saying, I think there's, I think the good outweighs the bad, but I'm not saying there's not scary things about this. Oh. Isn't, what, isn't the main idea and then we'll go back to, you, to uh, confirm the information that you're getting from it? Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, like, but on the other hand, you think about, I was, you know, I covered the state house, and now you can watch, I used to run around after the governor gave a speech and ask all the lawmakers, what do you think? Well, now you can just watch what the lawmakers think, and, you know, you don't need me as the middle person. I'm trying to think of how I can fit in. Now this is like jump rope. Okay, sorry. We're going back. Uh, I, well, I, you know, you talked about Kentucky and how yeah. is a trailer, you know, your stepdad and the truck driver. And what I wanted to add is that I've been working with a sportscaster in Lexington. Uh -huh. And I think that there's a giant activity going on around sports that guys are tuning in to Twitter during the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. They are tweeting. Yeah. They are turning in, uh, tuning into the sports writers who are now online and tweeting the most outrageous gossip. You know, sports is really gossipy. I didn't know how much, you know, but he was on Twitter, so I began working with him. And so that's, I guess, what I'm going to talk about is the idea that there's topics yeah. that people are going to tune sure. into, whether they're looking at the state house records or what, and then those, I think, are going to become groups, and that's why everyone will get something out of it. OSU football games are always a trending topic on Twitter. Yes, yeah, so just tell you how big the newspaper the next day and read what the score was. Yeah. So who was next? Yeah. Jeff? Um, um, if you and you're talking about uh, the caller who, who was going to send information, you're talking about the death of the gatekeeper. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a newscaster uh, on my morning show, and I don't know what my role is anymore. You know, uh, I'd like to have a conversation with my audience. I think part of the role of journalism is to have these discussions. And then we have a big megaphone, but we don't know how to do it. And I'm just, how, how, you talk about, about the transition, and right. how, how, how do we even rebuild our structure, how do we identify ourselves as a media company? Yeah. You know, I would, the risk of being. Mike's my boss at WOMA. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so let me be devil's advocate. Help me out. Um, there's a large portion of our audience that doesn't want to interact with us. They just listen, or they just watch. We talk about all the Twitters during the Super Bowl. It's infinitesimally small compared to the number of people who just watch it and yell at the TV. The stats are 90% lurkers. Yeah. So you keep that in mind that you can't go, I don't, I don't think you can go too overboard by pushing this stuff, but it's a tremendous tool, just like the f telephone was with talk radio. 
It's a tremendous tool to interact with your audience and to gain information and to source and to find sources. We did a story on um, my boss was following Twitter during a windstorm last year. This woman was complaining about her nationwide 28th floor nationwide office swaying. We found her, we called her, we did a story on her. I mean, it was that's the kind of thing we use it for and interact. But don't don't think everybody's on it because right. they are. Well, I understand that that uh, it's maybe more useful as a source, maybe yeah. not as, as a mode for dialogue. But if we operate the same way, it's a recipe no, for dying. I mean, yeah. You scared me. Yeah. I would not even use it. Twitter is yes. best as a dialogue. Yes. That doesn't mean everyone's involved in the conversation. Right. Both good and bad. Right. On the good side. There are, what, 104 million active users of Twitter, give or take. I remember that was right. the stat that they said, I'm sure. 300,000 new people every day. Every day. And so it's certainly a small uh, percentage of people compared to a national broadcast audience, say. But at the same time, it's a large enough snapshot of the population that chances are you are going to find pretty much a witness to everything that's going on everywhere at some point or another. But the downside of it, is, is you're still looking at people that most likely have smartphones or at least have cell phones and they don't mind and they have getting a lot of text messages through it. So you do have an issue if you're really trying to get a snapshot of what's going on in the place. Are there underserved communities that aren't part of the conversation that you've just ignored because you're solely relying on them? Right. And so it goes both ways. Yeah, but the solely relying on, right. no. I mean, you've right. got to be, it's multi-platform now. Right. It's not just, and that's on my talk show too. We're taking in, you know, on the phone, of course, on Facebook, we, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll, yeah, and as soon as I can get my associate producer up to speed, we'll be taking questions and comments via Twitter. We did 140 characters, which is music to my ears. So, <laughs> but I, I think sometimes we're focused too much on um, reach and not on engagement. So the thing is, like you could say, and I think advertisers would say, well, you know, that ad went to 100,000 people or 200,000 people because it was in the dispatch, but it was on page A8. How many people actually saw the ad? And now you might say, oh, well, only 300 people clicked on my YouTube video. Yeah, but they opted in for your ad, which is a different kind of deal. And so, you know, we didn't know how to measure the old media, and now we don't know how to measure the new. You know, we have to sort of think about that. Just to kind of move this into a broader sphere, we're talking a lot about Facebook and Twitter and media and radio and what's going on today and how it's all changing. But I just finished working on our Mark Lucas for six months. Oh, we're talking about this. I'm sorry, you're talking about This is a game changer. This thing is a game changer. Um, it is. What we're predicting is going to happen. Kids are no longer going to carry books to school. They're going to carry this. Um, that's going to change everything. When a publisher or teacher... Well, it's gone. When teachers at Ohio State University try to publish right now, they have to write a book and, and send it to a publisher uh, and hope they get published. But now, they can publish electronically so right on one of these things, and so they become instant publishers. They can uh, modify content daily instead of having to wait for a new revision. Kids can read this stuff, and then they can write something to contribute and put that out online for the whole world to see. How many dissertations have been written in history Nobody's ever read oh, the teacher. Have you but seen the two year old that they end up not doing? Oh, yeah. Immediately the kid starts drawing on it, knows exactly what to do. Because you can see the two year old playing with the iPhone. Right. And, and so the whole point to finish, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's like Willy Wonka in the TV room with all that digital information. You've got the entire basic knowledge of the entire human experience in the palm of your hand wherever you go. And that's going to be the huge thing. It doesn't matter who My, my comment's a little bit different. I was just thinking about, it's true we have these tools, it's true we have all this stuff, but I'm right now my immediate concern is net neutrality and ma making sure people have access right. and issues around what the FCC ruling is going to be with regard to broadband and access. So I think that, um, I just want to, for folks who haven't talked about it, I don't know that much about it. I'm trying to become an expert on it. I've been doing a lot of reading in the last 10 days because somebody brought it to my attention in a way that I hadn't been paying attention. We had a FCC hearing here a couple of years ago. Some of you may have attended if you're from Columbus. And um, 
it was a different administration, so let me just say that. But that raised some concern about that, but now the rulings are going, I mean, we have some immediate things that are concerned for that. So we're doing all this talk as if we're presuming yeah. things are going to stay the same, right. more or less. It's like not going to stay the same, that's for sure. Yeah. Bethany, did you, did you have a question? No. Joe, sorry. I'm Jody, and I wanted to talk about, uh, we used it for Casino Free Columbus, and so there was like a handful of us that were able to use Google Alerts, watch for any breaking news, so, and as you know, there was a large media outlet in town that had an interest in the, you know, what happened with that issue, so it, we, instead of, you know, creating the news, we were basically distributing it, so you could look at our blog, our Twitter feed, and know, you know, and it was, not just from one source, and um, it, so it, I felt like it was just this equalizer to that we weren't really staking a position in whether it passed or failed, but we want to provide transparency, and if you want to quickly find out what's the news and the issue, what's the current, then we could provide that, and you know, really it was, you know, eight people that were doing work. Yeah, well thanks. So. Mike? I'd like to pick up on your comment about how the entire human experience is going to be available on the iPad. You're 24 hours in the day, you spend a good eight hours of them sleeping. How am I supposed to cut through all of that entire human experience and read the best stuff? How, how do we break through? And to, you said it, there are dissertations that have never been read. My guess is there'll be dissertations that still won't be read. <laughs> <laughs> Even if on the iPad. I'm with you. <laughs> Collaborative yeah. filtering. Yeah. Is anybody yeah. familiar with deep web searches? Or have you guys looked at some of deep, the deep web searches that are coming? Because if you haven't yet, it's really mind blowing. Um, you know, Google, deep web searches are, Google searches the internet, but deep web searches search, search databases, and they go about 500 times deeper. So if you haven't pipeled yourself yet, you should, P I P L dot com because it's more of a deep web search, it'll go into databases, it's all in its infancy, but, or spokeo.com, S-P-O-K-E-O.com, you'll be amazed. In Kip Camp, we do these three-day trainings. This guy the other day said, wow, I posted, a, um, I posted an internet message you know, to a listserv in 1994, and it's on here. And this other guy said, my girlfriend is on here. My wife knows, my, my ex-girlfriend, fortunately my wife knows about her, but you know, all kinds of stuff will come up. It had my last seven addresses, my closest living relative in Columbus. I mean, the deep web is really gonna start to change the flow of information too, and start to help us, it aggregates data. So it takes all the data, so if I have your email address, for example, it'll search the top 44 social networking sites, aggregate the data, and send it all to me on an ongoing basis. It really <coughs> how, does a, how does a publisher, that would be looking for you, but if you are a publisher, then this opens up the opportunity to publish your own stuff. You don't have to go through random house. How do you get people to find you? I mean, it's just not going to be the same. You have to, you know, I, well, that's where I think you get back to informal, engaging, creative. You know, we find people we've never heard of who are engaging and creative in new ways. So yeah. the opportunities are there. You, know. you, you still, I mean, you still have the issue of who is providing the data and who are the gatekeepers when you only have so many hours hearing the data. That's a valid point. But the, what Ann said was it's, this, it's now completely democratic. So we all can have an influence. We don't necessarily control it because we don't, we don't get to say how prominent it is. And we're still dealing, and this is a problem, but we're still dealing with people we uh, want to follow and viewpoints that we may um, have some, have some uh, uh, predisposition to, to trust. So, so somebody who's on, on the right is going to follow commentators or gatekeepers on the right. So there's, there's that, that's an issue. But you still have this ability for everybody, anybody can, if you want to find something, go out there and, and, and get something. It used to be more passive. It used to be yes. that the newspaper wound up on our front porch every morning and we pick or in the evening, we used to have two. Uh, and we'd pick it up and we would read it. And we had that was all we had to look at besides, you know, Walter Cronkite on television at night. Uh, now we still have the quality out there, and I think what's going to happen, I hope and I pray what's going to happen is, and I think it already is, is it's the same thing. The market will drive. People will go to the best stuff. There'll still be the crap out there. There always has been. Um, but uh, then people, you know, it, then it'll, it'll flow. And uh, then people will find it, and the more people find it, the more people talk about it. Twitter's a great example of how people link to stuff, and I'm going to stuff that I never even existed now. 
Fox, and it's fantastic stuff. I mean, yeah. so they're connecting me with stuff, and you know, there are popular Twitterers out there. You know, Roger Ebert, yes. <laughs> Jay Roger Ebert. Yes. I mean, they're they're and they're popular because they keep driving us to stuff that's really good. Or you got it, you know. So if, if we did, we could just take it more and more and more. But we're not passing it. I was just gonna say I don't even really use RSS feeds anymore to, to monitor sites and yeah. consume content yeah. because pretty much everything I was interested in anyway, my friends are talking about right. it on Twitter. On Twitter. I know. And if they're to not, and I'm trying to find something and it's not obvious how to get to it, simply by asking on Twitter, I usually get a yeah. five Well, and if I want to know what the opposite side or another side is thinking, there's plenty of people to go to on Twitter that exactly. can drive me in that direction too. We've been saying, I know you had your hand up forever. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. information out there that you have to be really thoughtful and creative about what you put out there or no one's going to follow you. because that's the problem. It's expensive. Journalism is a good, original journalism is very expensive. Journalists are very expensive, and they are. I mean, good ones ought to be, so I'm not, I'm not gonna even get into that. I mean, hopefully everybody appreciates the value of that, but how do you pay for it? Because it's not translating, the revenue's not translating to the internet. And even if they charged on the internet, you know, you can have like the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, you know, they have special things, and the Columbus Dispatch, God love them, has their, whatever, the Buckeye Special or whatever that thing is. It, I'm sure they're making more money out of that than they are the whole rest of the online newspaper. But there are exceptions <coughs> to people who are the How many of you guys have heard of Chris Brogan? Oh, yeah. Chris, Chris Brogan. Brogan. Have you read Crush Road Statements? Right? He talks all about this, how to use the new media, how to build trust, how to build the community. He's on the New York Times bestseller list. He is making money. He's consulting. He's doing it. He's selling ads. How's he making his money? He's selling ads on his site. He 
Wrote a book. Wrote a book. Wrote a book. Initial media. He's at the end on the circuit. But you know, it's very similar to people who are successful in motivational speaking and self help books. In fact, I would argue that both Chris Brogan and Gary V are motivational speakers and self help books. They are. He's probably made he's made more money on the circuit probably than than he made building his wine business to fifty million. Right. But so it's it's you know, there are only a handful of people who are actually that are gonna right. generate huge careers for themselves. And, and how does that transit different. into a community newspaper situation? So you have these big huge um, you know communication companies that are out there and they also own like for instance as you pointed out yesterday and I just heard on NPR myself at Washington Post, most of its revenue, the thing that's keeping it afloat right now is Capital University. You know, which is why you Right, well, Newsweek, and I said, um, what's his name, meet him on uh, MPR, or on PBS last night. So, uh, you know, it's all changing very, very quickly. And it's not just, but you look at the New York Times, they just borrowed money from that oligarch in Mexico because no one else is going to loan them money. I mean, even the New York Times is more than a billion dollars in debt. And that's a company that controls hundreds of newspapers. You think about where we're I think it's still hundreds. I mean, I don't think any of us have the answers, but we know that the ground has shifted. And you know we know we can't keep doing the same things that we used to do. That's not going to work. And for me, I've sort of figured out, uh, you know, what we're doing because I run a journalism program. And even for us, we had, to, you know, we're doing social media training now because we realized, okay, if we were running a traditional, if, when I started at the Kiplinger program, we were saying come and spend six months writing, and then we said, okay, this isn't going to sustain us because because we were t teaching people how to do investigative reporting that papers aren't going to let you do in the same way. So now we say, come and we'll teach you how to tell visual stories and how to brand yourself on you know, Facebook and how to think about strategic Twittering and all that kind of stuff. So everybody's got to figure out, there isn't, I don't think there's an organization out there that hasn't made massive changes to try to keep pace. I don't really know what to do. Do you also need to look at it from the perspective of
Yeah, something that's there. Someone's going to take responsibility for it. Someone can be sued. That's a direct error. There is another side to that, and I'm going to name names and mention Brown Publishing. Anybody know who Brown Publishing is? This is run by Bud Clancy Brown, who is a former United States Senator, retired with the Republican Party. He owns 153 local newspapers around this country, and every one of them is senior to the right. Now, do we want to support them? Not necessarily. Up until now, though, those communities, that's all those people can read. Can I also say, you know how we're talking about we're in a mass communications world, and now we're in a massive communications world? Well, news in the, before we became a mass communications world, news was very slanted. Remember the age of the muckrakers? Everybody knew who they were tuning into. Yes. And it was only when we went to mass communications, the only reason news got neutral and we tried to, you know, stop having agendas is because you were selling ads to big, massive advertisers. And so today, now in a massive communications world, we're moving back to where we used to be more than 100 years ago. So in a sense, I'm not that worried. I mean, you know, I know when I'm watching Fox News what I'm getting. I, you know, most people do, I guess. Or I like to think most people do. And that's, I do think what we have to do is help people figure out digital literacy in this new world. I mean, we teach a lot. We use Spokio with our students and say, okay, last night, Sarah, we see that you had a really good party. And we show it in class because she's going, oh, wow, this is public. You know, and here's pictures of your cat, John, and here's what you posted online five years ago, the video of your vacation. And it helps people. We need to teach people what it means. When we say, what we say, and I, I stole this too, is what happens in Vegas stays on YouTube, right? And <laughs> so we have to think. Post, post once, think twice. I wanted to get into the Brown Publishing thing. What, what Brown tapped into was fabulous, and it's what a lot, you know, community newspapers, those local newspapers, like, um, you know, uh, Whatever we have around here, um, yeah. We read this week. Yeah, yeah. The local ones, wherever they are, the local suburban newspapers. What they have that the dispatch doesn't have, and really nobody else has, is local. Local, local, local. Everybody wants to see their kids' picture in the paper. I mean, my God. I mean, people want to see their kids in the name in the paper or the Worthington News because their kid was on the honor roll, and that's what they're selling. And then in the process, they can do the slanting. Well, what people are buying the paper for is to see themselves in the paper because the dispatch isn't going to do it anymore. But you make a good point. You have more options. Yeah. I don't know what the exact stat is, but something around 30% of NPR stations are the only locally owned exactly. news Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're local. That's our franchise. That's WOSU's franchise. That's why half of my programming I try to make local because that's what's something I can offer that nobody else can anymore. Yeah. So instead of the gatekeepers being the media and vetting the news for us, now How many people have seen United Breaks Guitars? Oh, yeah. It's not a bad thing in some sense that if an arrogant company doesn't take you seriously, you can stand up and do something about it. I mean, that's what I mean. When I say celebrate the death of the gatekeeper, I'm sort of saying I'm into the democratization of information. You know, I, I'm enjoying the fact that more of us have the ability, if we can tell powerful stories, we can find an audience. So the only question is, can we tell powerful stories? And in that sense, I, I mean, I like that if I don't like my local newspaper, I've got lots of other places that I can also find my news. And I think that's really positive. That uh, just sort of touches on, on something else I wanted to ask about and I haven't really heard much about, which is the, the localization mm -hmm. of, uh, of information and, and community and, and news and everything else, like Foursquare or whatever else. You know, Foursquare, we haven't even talked about that. Yeah, so I was wondering, RobMePlease.com, have you seen it? <laughs> RobMePlease.com. You know, they started that site because they were saying, look, I'm out of town. Look, I'm in right. Indiana. Right. Right. So they were, like, putting people on who were on Foursquare. So anyway, go on. No, I, I digress. That's actually very, I, I spend a lot of time traveling around the state right now, and uh, I, I've been very aware of, oh, don't say I'm going X, Y, or Z place. Okay. Right. Um, now, I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on the localization of, of, of sharing information and how that plays out. I mean, I think if you're really smart, there's amazing ways to take advantage of that. We did training for libraries the other day, and we were saying, look, we just did, some, we did a search on Foursquare, and here are the people in your library right now. Have you 
Have you sent them a message and said, welcome to my library, I'm really glad you're here. I mean, there's a lot of great ways that you can personalize, you know. I mean, if, I'm, if I want to announce that I'm in your library, then I might, I probably won't mind if you say hello. How many of you have checked in today to come here on Courseware Go Walla My Town or anything else? I'm kind of curious. Yeah. I was just at South by Southwest, and I mean, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. Go Walla and, and Courseware, the number of people trying to I found to a friend out. from high school I hadn't seen in 20 years. We were both checked in from the same party. Really fascinating. Really fascinating. At the, at the camp or in your um, facility, do you yeah. have measurable outcomes? Do you talk about that? Oh, yeah. If and, you, and what, if and you what can't do you measure use? it, you don't have a strategy. And I didn't make that up either. I steal all my good ideas. <laughs> but, uh, we, you know, we go through, like, Social Seek, for example. Has anybody looked at Social Seek? It's a great tool for, um, I can type in the Columbus Zoo and say, okay, here's everyone who's mentioned the Columbus Zoo in the last 30 days. Here's who's posted pictures of the zoo on Flickr. You know, here's, uh, and it'll do a semantic analysis. So here, you know, those are sketchy, but here's the people who are saying good things about you. Here are the people who are saying not so good things about you. You can go there and then say, oh, this person said something bad about me. How influential are they? You know, that sort of thing. Like we were working with this uh, business owner the other day and he was trying to get us to help him think through his social media strategy. And we said, okay, the good news is no one's saying anything bad about you. The bad news is no one's saying anything about you. And today, if you're trying to, you know, be out there, especially now with Twitters, you know, you can see what people are tweeting. <coughs> if I'm Googling you as a company, Twitter's gonna be like the third or fourth thing down. You've got, you want people talking about you in these spaces, in, in a good way. And that, I mean, you gotta have buzz in social media, but you, you can measure that. There's a lot of new tools, and that one's free. I mean, some people are paying premium tools like Radium 6 which can be really expensive, but every day they'll look and say, here's who, what people are saying about you and here's how influential they are. So if I tweet out about a company, that company should know who I am and how many followers I have and all of that. And so ideally the business, they'll message me. With the business owner then, how does that business owner know that the tweeting is helping the business? Well, at least you can see, a really good example of this is Comcast Cares, have you heard of this? Comcast, people hated Comcast so much they did a, a website called ComcastMustDie.com. <laughs> it was very popular. Uh, and so they started Comcast Cares on Twitter and the number of searches, you know, they were starting to measure the number of people who typed in, if you typed in Comcast sucks, it was over 200,000 hits, but now if you typed in Comcast Cares, there were, you know, hundreds of thousands of hits. So they were starting to see that they were changing their reputational capital. And now they have 10 people just answering complaints on Twitter. So, you know, you, I mean, you start to measure it in terms of what are people <laughs> saying. It's still the, it was still one of the worst companies. People still eat that company. still one of the worst companies. It's all you know, just last week. But people, you know, but like the Comcast cares not, that, you know, it sort of went out of business. And, um, and the guy who started it, if you read Chaos Scenario, he sort of did away with it because he said at least they're responding. I'm not saying that they're better. I'm just saying they're trying to respond now, or at least look as if they're responding. Frank Elias is pretty, he's like one of the most popular guys on Twitter because he's trying to answer all these complaints about Comcast. But you just have to figure out, are people, what are people saying about you, and is it good or is it bad, and how are you building reputational capital? My argument, is, though, is that you couldn't measure, it was hard to measure before, and it's hard to measure now. You know. It's all about it. Something that I'm also wondering is how have, how does the way we communicate and how we have to communicate change um, with these different types of media? Whether you are a professional or a journalist or just someone trying to get your voice out there, what what are some of the kind of key things that you? One thing that I've learned is I do post, you know, on Facebook and on Twitter, you know, uh, not as often on Twitter because it's 140 characters, but what I'm going to have on the next show, kind of a thing. But I've got to do a lot more than that because I got to let people get to know who I am too. So I try to, and it's I just don't. It's not really that much work. It's just sitting down, and that's probably not about learning at lunch. I don't do that. Um, uh, I just got somebody who was there checking into the hospital yesterday. It's like, whatever. But, um, you know, just to, I have to do more about putting myself into it and not make it so commercial. Because that goes to the casual, what's real? What am I doing real? Maybe I'm being people, you know, and, and people like to know, you know, what I'm thinking sometimes. Because that helps them understand me more, get to know me a little bit better. When I'm on the air. My best example of this is Chicago Tribune. They have a formal Twitter feed and they tweet out formally and they have 26,000 followers. 
They have an informal Colonel Tribune, and he wears a funny newspaper hat, and he answers questions back and forth, 870,000 followers. If we have the option, we tune in to informality. You know? We do not want people to be that formal, that's the way it is kind of person. And I say in social media, if you show up formal, you're like the person who shows up in a suit at the barbecue. We know it immediately, and we don't trust you. You know, we're like, who is this? Because you're trying to use yeah. me, you're trying to manipulate me. Yeah. And the only thing I don't do is swear. But I do refer people, one of my favorite <laughs> Facebook friends that shit my dad said. So, you know, people know that, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, you I, I do it. You got a Pardon me? You got a sip. Oh, cool. Wow, no, you know, my God. Does everybody know? Yeah, shit my dad. Yeah, oh, no, it's look, so cool. hilarious. And, and, you know, it's fun and it says something about me, but I don't have to run around. And we do a whole class of In the real world, we don't use cohort because I teach public policy. No one ever says, let's get a cohort together and go to the movies. We just don't talk that way. <laughs> So I think even if you can just get rid of acronyms and jargon, you're, uh, you know, 30% better than everybody else. Because people, it was hard for me as a journalist. I speak even sort of, you know, I wrote somewhat formally. We think we don't, but we're writing with AP style. And, our, and I, I tell journalists, you're not competing with your neighboring, or you're not competing with your neighboring newspaper. You're competing with your neighbor, and your neighbor is presenting really powerful content. So it's very, you know, you just gotta think. And they don't, they don't have to write in AP style. So it's a different. Yeah, you know, and the language is changing. A grammar girl recognizes that the language yeah. is changing. She tries to respond to that <coughs> in a really, really proactive way. The language has always changed. I mean, if you go back 150 years, if you go back 50 years, the language has changed. So we quickly, you know, we've always resisted it along the way. She embraces it and tries to find how the rules fit in and how that makes sense. But she's also started, uh, she has a Twitter, I think, she has a, 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 a 10 rules, or not rules, but 10 guidelines for how to write on Twitter, so that oh, you're fun. relatively grammatically <coughs> correct, you're understandable, and you're sure. casual and yeah. fun to listen to and fun to read. Kind of okay, I think we have to wrap up. Is there any, anybody want to make a final comment or thought? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It was fascinating. <laughs> Break, which means we can just keep chatting in here if we want yeah. or just grab some